Welcome to Murder Mile, a true crime podcast, an audio guided walk featuring many of London's untold, unsolved, and long forgotten murders, all set within and beyond the West End. Today's episode is about the murder of Kate Beagley, a smart, independent woman who had agreed to go out for a drink with a handsome young man. She did everything right. She took every precaution, and yet the only mistake she made was the one we all make. She knew nothing about this stranger. Murder Mile is researched using authentic sources. It contains moments of satire, shock, and grisly details. And as a dramatization of the real events, it may also feature loud and realistic sounds, so that no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 87, The First Date Killer. Today, I'm standing on Richmond Hill, the furthest west we've travelled but a story which visits many places we've covered before. Starting in a West End nightclub, one street from where the blackout ripper met Greta Haywood, the killer living on Kemble Street, where Mary Ann Moriarty axed her abusive husband to death, part of his escape taking place just a few streets from the home of Katerina Konyeva, and the murder itself within sight of the Thames Topath murders. Coming soon... To murder mile. The terrace on Richmond Hill is world famous. It may not look much, but being a sandy gravel track, high on a hill, dotted with trees and lined with rows of wooden benches, all facing west, with only rich townhouses behind and nothing in front, this unspoiled vista of the River Thames, snaking through the lush greenery of Richmond Park and Hampton Court, is protected by an Act of Parliament. It's a place of beauty, tranquility and romance, where many people travel to soak up the sights, and even for those just passing, it's impossible not to stop, sit and silently see the sunset. The terrace is a place for couples. Here you can see it all. Old codgers doddering along hand in hand, sweaty youngsters playing tonsil tennis, the recently wed who've blown 50 grand only to notice that it's still same shit different day, and the three monthers who having stopped rutting realize they've got nothing to say so all they do is hug and kiss every six seconds. As well as the married ones who only have eyes for their phones, the soon to be divorced seeking a high ledge to shove, Tinder dates banging away in the bushes, and of course, the best relationship ever anyone with a dog, as it's all about loyalty, belly tickles, and even though one of them has spent the day licking their arsehole, lots of kissing. This is also a great place to come on a first date, as you don't need to talk, you just need to sit. And although it's pretty much the perfect place for love to blossom, even a romance can turn into a tragedy. As it was here, on Wednesday the 30th of May 2007, having met just days before, that Kate Beagley would begin her date with Carl Taylor, and this beauty spot would turn into a scene of horror. Unlike so many tragic stories, Kate's is not exceptional. She was just an ordinary woman doing an everyday thing for a very normal reason. So take Kate's story as a cautionary tale. Thirty-two-year-old Kate Beagley was a delight. Described by her friends and family as being a brilliant mix of head and heart, she was smart and savvy, bubbly and bold, clever and kind. An independent lady who many described as the complete package. She was brilliant, beautiful, but also very down-to-earth. 
Born and raised in Hounslow, West London, Kate was raised in a close-knit family who stuck together through thick and thin. They taught her to be moral and decent. They encouraged her to be strong and confident. And living in a big city, instead of filling her head with fear, they armed her with all of the precautions a young lady should take, but ensured she had the confidence to live her life to the full. If you're wondering why I'm telling you this, it's because there's no reason why anyone should hate her. She had no big issues, no dark past, and no dark secret. She didn't have debts, enemies, or fears. She drank in moderation, but preferred to drive. She didn't do drugs, but didn't judge those who did. And she didn't commit crimes, but didn't preach to those who had. She didn't start fights, curse strangers, or rub people up the wrong way. In short, she didn't have a bad bone in her body. She was special to those who knew her, but unremarkable to those who didn't. She didn't stick out, and she didn't slink away. She was ordinary, just like you and me. With dreams of seeing the world, Kate graduated university with a degree in tourism. It was a perfect choice for her, as although she loved people, travel, and having fun, also being sensitive, level-headed, and incredibly generous. Kate was a real people pleaser, who always put others before herself. As with most of us, her dream didn't pan out. So instead, she plowed her skills into a regular job as national compliance manager for the energy company Centrica, where she had been for about ten years. She was polite, punctual, and recently promoted. She had a good team, a steady income. A shiny grey VW Golf as a company car, and she owned her own flat in Walton on Thames. And that was Kate's life in a nutshell. She liked music and reading. She had a good life balance between family and friends. She was recently single and looking for love. She had a few minor worries over her mum's health and her career, but having made some notes in a self-help book called "You Can Heal Your Life." She wasn't unduly worried. Just like you and me, she was ordinary, unremarkable, but special in her own way. With work over and the weekend here, Kate and her pals went out to the West End. That night, Kate met Carl Taylor, and twelve days later, she was dead. Friday, the eighteenth of May, two thousand and seven, was the weekend before the bank holiday. Typical for Britain, it was wet and gloomy, so the streets were empty, but the pubs were packed with punters. For the girls, it was just a regular night out, but more importantly, as they drank booze and were chatted up by blokes, they kept an eye out for each other. At eleven p.m. As the pubs closed, Kate and her chums headed to the CC Club at 13 Coventry Street, W1, a now defunct West End nightclub between Piccadilly Circus and Leicester Square. Hailed as host to many West End parties, with a strict dress to impress policy, a funky mix of R&B, hip hop, and what was dubbed booty shaking tunes. Having been here before, they knew it was a safe place to unwind. Being an attractive, bubbly young lady who exuded warmth, it wasn't a surprise that Kate drew the attention of men. But being taught to be savvy around strangers, she knew how to be engaging, polite, and yet keep her distance until she was certain he wasn't a weirdo. One man who Kate was instantly attracted to was 27-year-old Carl Taylor. As a handsome young man with brown cropped hair. A neat designer beard, and casual, fashionable clothes, he looked good. As a confident, chatty, and cheeky chappy, he had the gift of the gab. Being small but athletically built, 
It was unsurprising to hear that he was a fitness instructor and a martial arts trainer. But as he also did unpaid coaching for an under 12s football team, she could see that he was serious, but he had a soft side. There was clearly a chemistry between them, a spark. So as they both gave off the right signals, and her friends had no reason to disapprove, Kate and Carl exchanged phone numbers. With the night over, the girls drank up, hopped into cabs, and headed home, promising to text each other to say, I made it home safe, which they did. It was a fun but unremarkable evening. Over the next 10 days, Kate and Carl texted, flirted, and having got to know each other a little bit better, they agreed to meet on the 30th of May 2007. That was their first date together, and Kate's last day alive. Now, you know he is pure evil. But without the benefit of hindsight, how would Kate know that? Well, she didn't. So although she planned to have a nice time, being a savvy lady, she took every precaution. Wednesday the 30th of May 2007 was just a very ordinary day. Kate left work at 5pm, arrived home at 6pm, changed from work clothes to smart casual, popped in to see her parents, and having told her friends and family her plans for the evening, she left Walton on Thames at 7.30pm. Having chosen a midweek date for this meetup, as she wasn't going to drink or stay out late, she had opted to drive and agreed to pick up Carl halfway. The 12 mile journey took 45 minutes. And at 8.20 p.m., as she often did on first dates, she texted her friend. It read, in Chiswick, to meet Carl. At 8.30, spotting him dressed in a black tracksuit and a dark fur-lined jacket, she picked up Carl on Chiswick High Road, drove her silvery-grey VW Golf seven and a half miles southwest of Richmond Hill, and having parked up under a light on a residential street. At 8.50 p.m., Kate texted her friend. It read, made it to Richmond. To inject an air of romance into an awkward situation, Kate and Carl sat on a bench as they watched the sunset over the Thames. With thick leaves in the trees above and a weak glow from the street lamps behind, the terrace was dark, but being a public place full of people, she knew it was a safe space. At 9.08pm exactly, with most of May being a typically British drizzly wet washout, as the sunset was less of a fiery red orb, and more like an old aspirin dunked into a dirty glass of brown fizz. As the joggers and walkers left, so did Kate and Carl, as they headed a few yards away to the pub for a drink. At 9.31pm, CCTV captured the couple enter the Roebuck pub. Being a very traditional, if slightly old-fashioned British boozer, the bar was brightly lit, the music was low, and it was half full of regulars. Kate and Carl sat at a table by the window, but it was clear that the mood was solid. And as much as Carl kept talking, Kate kept texting, keeping her friends abreast of how badly the date was going. After just one hour, she had witnessed the real Carl Taylor, and she didn't like what she had seen. The sweet, kind, and charismatic man she had met in the CC club had gone. And in his place was a vain, arrogant asshole who was only in love with himself. A self-professed ladies' man who bragged about his many conquests. An emotionally unstable boy who would be laughing one second and close to tears the next. And a shameless womanizer who, including tonight, had cheated on his girlfriend. At 10.30pm, having had enough, Kate finished her orange juice, politely told him she was going home, 
they left the pub and walked a few yards of Richmond Hill towards Kate's car. The date was over. But Carl couldn't find his house keys, and as he couldn't leave without them, and she wouldn't leave without him, doing the decent thing, Kate helped Carl retrace their steps to find his keys. Of course, we know they weren't missing. We know they were in his pocket. But Kate had no way to know that. Using the bright beams of their phone's torches, they scoured the path's grey stone slabs, the sandy gravel track, and the dark recesses behind the bench where they had watched the sun set. But with no sight of his keys, they retraced their steps to where this awful date had began, and where it would end. 100 yards west is the most famous part of the terrace, a stunning 18th century garden shaped by black wrought iron gates, neat cultivated bushes, and a series of sandstone steps leading to two ornate terraces. It's beautiful, iconic, and romantic. But at night, it's also dark, silent, and remote. For Kate, this little detour was little more than a mild annoyance. And being just 30 feet from her car, the road, and a few houses, she felt that she was safe. But with her head down, her eyes focused, and her ears listening out for the clink of keys, she had no idea who her date really was, or what he had in mind. While held at Wandsworth Prison, he claimed he had accidentally stabbed her as he tried to steal her car. He said, She wouldn't give her keys to me. Then she started moving and shaking. The knife went into her windpipe and she died. Only we know that was a lie. At the Old Bailey, his defence was that Kate was depressed. And using the knife he only carried when he felt suicidal, that she had killed herself. Later stating, I realised she had passed away. I lay on the grass. I was crying profusely. Only we know that that was also a lie. And although, in front of her bewildered family, he displayed how she had repeatedly stabbed herself in the neck with his knife, when asked in court why this fitness instructor, who was trained in martial arts, hadn't disarmed her, he replied, I didn't know this girl. I just didn't know what to do. But that too was a lie. The real truth was truly horrific. Having been distracted by a fruitless search for a set of missing keys, from inside the sleeve of his fur-lined jacket, he pulled a kitchen knife. Kate was subjected to a brutal and frenzied attack. But in those brief and terrifying seconds, Carl had plunged the six-inch blade deep into her face, neck and head. A total of 31 times. So fierce was his hate-filled rage that he shattered her facial bones, split open her airway, splintered her spinal cord, and having severed both her carotid artery and jugular vein, Kate bled out on the cold stone steps and died just moments later. At 10.40pm, as the dimly lit street was still quiet, no sirens were heard, nobody passed by, and not a single curtain twitched in the houses opposite. Being a cloudy, moonless night, Carl dragged her lifeless body up the stone steps, bundled her remains into her car boot, and drove off. At 11.50pm, the silvery-grey VW Golf was caught on a camera crossing Chiswick Bridge. At 12.20am, at the BP garage on Shepherd's Bush Green, the car pulled in, Carl calmly phoned his girlfriend, joked with the other drivers, and used Kate's bank card to fill up with fuel. 
Her corpse was hidden by his fur-lined jacket, and the thick spatter of her blood was masked by his black tracksuit. At 1.40 a.m., 15 miles northwest, he drove to Oxywood's car park, a dark, isolated wooded space used by visitors of the nature reserve. But being a weekday, and after midnight, it was empty. There he stripped her of her clothes and her dignity, used water to wash away his DNA, dumped her dead body in the bushes, and casually tossed the knife and her clothes from her car window as he fled down the M1 motorway. His only thoughts were for himself, not for Kate, her friends, or her family. The next morning, when Kate failed to show up for work, her colleagues knew that this was unusual. When she didn't reply to any calls, texts, or emails, her friends grew concerned. And with her car missing and her flat empty, her family suspected the worst. Having been missing for 24 hours, Kate's father, Alan, alerted the police. And although her disappearance was initially classed as a missing person's, with her vanishing being out of character, they quickly escalated it to a possible kidnapping. But Kate was nowhere to be found. Just hours after her murder, as this supposedly remorseful killer sped around the streets of Harlston, the car boot still soaked, his tracksuit stained, his fur-lined jacket bloodied. As the VW Golf's wheels screeched outside of his friend's flat, although Adrian Cardbo was still fast asleep, he was rudely awoken by Carl, who cockily crowed, Wakey, wakey, rise and shine! Being in high spirits, the callous killer was all smiles, as he wanted to brag to his pals and take his new car for a spin. As Kate's colleagues stared at her empty desk, terrified for her safety and painfully missing their friend, Carl was whizzing about as he zipped around in his brand new VW Golf for trips out with his chum and shopping trips with his girlfriend. He even drove his nephew to play school. To his passengers, it must have seemed strange that although Carl had said he had bought this car, it was still filled with the previous owner's stuff. Like Robbie Williams' CDs, Marks and Spencer's vouchers, a self-help book called You Can Heal Yourself, and a Nokia phone, which when it started ringing, Carl ripped out the battery, the SIM card, and tried to flog it off to Adrian. But finding Carl Taylor wouldn't be difficult. Having met him only once, Kate's friends recalled his name, his face, and his job. With the police searching Kate's bank cards, they found crystal clear footage of the suspect buying fuel. And with Kate's work mobile still in her flat and containing a text from Carl, he was arrested the next day. On Friday the 1st of June 2007, barely 36 hours after her murder, Carl was questioned. At first, he refused to give any answers and simply replied, no comment, to every question. Then, being vague and evasive, he claimed that the date went well and that she had dropped him off in Twickenham. After that, he concocted an implausible story about her suicide, having gleaned her personal thoughts from some notes she had written in a self-help book. And finally, after several hours of cross-examination, in what was still just a potential kidnapping, Carl Taylor broke down and confessed to the murder of Kate Beagley. All the while, still implying that it was her fault. She was grabbing me, and I stabbed her in the throat. I constantly and consistently caught her in the neck because she was going for my face. Later that day, Carl led the police to Kate's car, which he had parked on Leopold Road in Harlesden. Inside, they found DNA from both the victim and the suspect. Her blood still stained the boot, the steering wheel, and his clothing. 
His fingerprints were found on her phone, purse and bank cards. Along the M1 motorway, they found her torn clothes, the bloodied knife, the water bottle he had used to bathe her. And on the morning of Monday the 4th of June 2007, just five days later, the naked and decomposing body of 32-year-old Kate Beagley was found. Carl Joseph Taylor was tried at the Old Bailey. He pleaded not guilty to murder. He stuck to his story that Kate had committed suicide. And he even used his time in the witness box to brag about his success with women. But after an eight-month investigation, a two-week trial, and overwhelming evidence, a unanimous jury took just two hours to find him guilty and he was sentenced to life in prison. From his prison bunk, always being arrogant to the last, Carl wrote a letter to Kate's grieving family in which he called the prosecution obscene and made himself out to be this case's real victim. It read, We live in a world where life is hard for us all, and those who try and embrace the good nature get rejected. Without any doubt, what I did was wrong. But ask yourself this. Whose life have I really taken? Kate's dad paid tribute to his daughter, saying, Kate was a loving, thoughtful daughter, sister and friend, as devoted to us as we were to her. Our family has been devastated and life seems empty and meaningless. I left her looking forward to an evening out and she was brutally murdered by the man she went to meet. Kate had done nothing, made no mistakes and took every precaution when she went out on a date. The man she met could have been anyone, a nobody, a new friend or even a future husband. But instead, she met her death. So although Kate's story is a cautionary tale, I don't mean for you to live your life in fear, but to live your life to the fullest, as Kate would have. Because you never know which day will be your last. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. Don't forget, as always, We have some extra Murder Mile goodies after the break. So plop a bag in your mug, a splash of milk and two sugars, and get ready for some utter drivel from yours truly. Before that, a thank you to my new Patreon supporters, who this week are Nicola Zeba and Amy Hussein. I thank you. With a big thank you to anyone who shares Murder Mile in person or on social media. As this podcast is, let's to be honest, an acquired taste for only the best and most intelligent true crime fans, that means you, these personal recommendations are hugely appreciated. If you do one, please feel free to tag Murder Mile in and I'll share it far and wide. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult with No Name. Thank you for listening and sleep well. Job done, job done. Windows open, windows open time. Oh, windows open. Oh, let some air in. Oh, there we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Extra Mile. Extra Mile time. Wah, wah. Wah, it's exciting. He makes a cup of tea. He eats cake. Wah, it's exciting. Wah, what's he going to do next? Next week, he might have a poo. Oh, wah, exciting. He might have a little tinkle in the background. Wah, someone, a jogger might go past him. He might make a comment about them. Go, oh, I wish they'd bugger off. Oh, look, there's a coot behind. Oh, the coot's making noises. Mike's going to shake his fist at it and go, bloody coot, shut up. (laughs) Uh, That could happen. That probably will happen. Uh, Hello, everyone. 
Welcome, how are we all? We all good? We all good and tip top and tally ho and what what and all etc etc etc. All good, all good, that's good to know. Um, uh, for new people, new people, why are you joining on episode 87? Go go back to the start. Or, I mean, you don't have to, you can listen to all these in a random order, it's fine. But uh, episode 87, uh, welcome to Murder Mile. This is the, the random bits, this is uh, all just off the top of my head so don't so if any, anything's incorrect in it don't message me about it don't go oh, you said this you said that you said this yeah, it's all wrong this is I, i've got no notes i've literally just have like a couple of bullet points in front of me and i'm just talking shit but there'll, there'll be some uh, uh, uh i'll fill you in on some extra stuff to do with this case very shortly but first tea I've gotta make a cup of tea oh window open Open the doors, open the doors, let some air in. Oh, I was racing to get that done because there's uh, obviously this is this is the first day uh, after all of the hang on. this is the first day after all of the schools shut in the UK. Hang on, I put my tea bag in, put my sugar in, Miss Sugar, Miss Sugar, Miss Sugar. That's a proper milk today, only because I'm worried that I was going to run out of. Uh, I was worried that I was going to run out of uh, powdered milk because all the everyone's hoarding powdered milk. People who normally would go, uh, powdered milk are hoarding it now, bastards. So because uh, I haven't got a fridge, I'm having to use regular milk, which is fine. Last night because I've got two, I, I could only get two pints of milk rather than a little pot, and so I ended up having to make a, a, a pint of Angel Delight. Yum. Anyway, no, I was up early because it's. All the schools were chucked out yesterday in the United Kingdom, so all schools are shut now. So uh, I was like, oh shit, all the little bastards are going to be awake. They're all going to be sugared up and running around the streets going, Aah! no, we're meant to be indoors, but we're hyper, we're hyper. Aah! Aah! 16 weeks off. But it's been really quiet, which is good. So, uh, yeah. So, right. Uh, oh, what's going on? How are you all? Are you all good? Oh, chin up, chin up, as we say. Chin up, it all could be worse. You know? Uh, for me, it's it's gone weird, but you know what? Not really that bothered. It's like you got, to, as I say, you got to roll with the punches. What's happening? Murder Mile walks shut down, shut down, gone. Uh, yeah, uh, th they're all gone, unfortunately. So I've had to shut those down till further notice. The e shop, uh, you can, you can download free stuff on there, but there's no sales. Obviously, people are saving their money. I don't blame them. Well, my podcast provider has already, already messaged me saying you're going to see a slump in revenue. That's fine. I understand that. Live show, which was meant to be next Tuesday, that's been postponed until 24th of June. So if you've got tickets to the Secrets of Serial Killer show, that's now tentatively on the 24th of June. Let's hope everything's sorted by then. The new tour that I'd mentioned about, that's postponed as well. Uh, I've got no, no money coming in for the future. I spent three days issuing refunds, which is, which is fine. I totally get it. I'd messaged everyone who, who had tickets coming up and I said, look, guys, it's not going to happen. You can either transfer your tickets till later or, or I said look I can offer you a refund now and I totally get it so it's uncertain times we don't know how long this will be so so uh, many people ask for refunds which is fine so I, I spent two days doing refunds so, but it's, it's scary when you're sitting there you've got no money coming in and you're like oh shit I'm in negative now but that's fine it's all done so uh, if anyone you when everything's over re if you want to rebook on the tour that'd be lovely we'd love to see you but it's I hope everyone's well and I totally get it I'm I, we need to save money as much as possible because even though our bullshit prime minister says this will be done in 12 weeks we know we know that this could this this could roll on until until winter easily so uh it's 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 a virus it's unpredictable it's not a man it's not a, you know something we can control so so prepare for the worst prepare for the worst and just be ready um but you know what we're not dead uh, if you listen to this, you're not dead. That's a good thing. We're all still alive. We've all just got to hunker down a little bit. Uh, I've told Eva, my girlfriend, Eva Green. Oh, dear Lord, she's such a nightmare. I've told her she has to have less new shoes every week. So she's agreed to limit herself to just 10 new pairs of shoes a week. 10 new pairs. That's a sacrifice. You don't, you don't understand what a sacrifice that is for Eva. She's like, she's getting a bit stressy. You know, she's going into a cupboard and it's, you know, there's only a couple of thousand pairs of shoes in there. And that, that's, for her, that's budgeting. Uh, serious budgeting. Me, less cake. 
Uh, they're running out of Bakewell, Bakewell tarts. They're running out of Bad Battenbergs are gone. Oh my God, I know. So for for me, this is difficult. But you know what? I was putting on a bit of chunkage anyway, so it's you know, good, good. A little bit less cake. That's a good thing. But as I've said to people, do you know what? You may think this is a difficult thing at the moment, but let's not forget this. This helps us put everything into perspective, what we really need. Do you know, sitting down going, oh, I need to watch this thing on Netflix. No, you don't. You don't need to watch it on Netflix. All this kind of crap we worry about. Do you know, I, I think next week the Internet's going to go a little bit fuzzy because, you know, everyone's online. Every, you know, people have got nothing to do and they're like, oh, I need to watch the latest film. I need to download this series. Oh, oh, oh. It's like, I need to get online. I need to talk about myself and show pictures of my food. It's like, no, you don't. It's like, hopefully the Internet will creak. It will get, hopefully you can still get podcasts. But hopefully people will sort out, you know, what they need to do, what's important in life, what isn't important. Do you know what? Even though we're meant to be self-isolating, you can still go for a walk. You can still walk around in the park. That's good for you. Do you know, it's just about not being around other people. So that's good. Um, but also it's a time to think about not being selfish. You see all these people hoarding toilet roll and think about themselves. But let's not let's not, not forget, when you go around uh, supermarkets, it's actually the elderly who are affected most. They're the ones who are most likely to get the virus and unfortunately to die from the virus. But they're also the ones who don't have a big SUV that they can fill up with toilet rolls. They're, they probably don't have a car. They just have a little basket. They're doddering around. They can't reach the high shelves. And they get there and there's nothing left because, you know, selfish people have nicked it. So, uh, yeah, think think it's time, to, it's time to start thinking about other people as opposed to thinking about yourselves. Uh, I don't just mean you, I mean everyone really. Uh, but you know what? It's you know, enjoy life, have fun, uh, appreciate what you've got. That's what it's all about. And I've got, I've got tea, and uh, and obviously Eva, obviously yeah. Can't forget Eva. I've got Eva, and uh, she knows about this as well. I've got Eva, and I've got I've got Kate Blanchett. She's my other girlfriend and Audrey Tattoo. Oh, Audrey Tattoo. Oh, I'm gonna let my tea stew for a bit. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Just enjoy, just enjoy life. Appreciate this for what it is. Uh, downside for me, well, apart from work and all that, can't can't go and see mum or grand because obviously they're but they're both in care homes and the care homes are locked down. But the staff in there are all doing a fantastic job. They really are. Hats off to everyone who works in care homes at the moment. They're really good. They they're calling me up like every uh, twice a week just to check that, just to say that everything's okay, uh, which is good. So my hats go off to everyone who's basically working in the healthcare industry, all the nurses and doctors, and everyone, all the uh, especially all the cleaners in all the places. They must be working their asses off. All the police. Uh, thank you to Police Constable Arsenal Guinness, who is obviously keeping London safe. Uh, everyone who works in shops, all the utilities companies, truckers, keeping this, uh, keeping the country running. Basically, a big thank you to everyone that we kind of all expect to be there. Um, but it's, uh, we only really think about them when uh, things start going wrong, when we realise they're not there anymore. So, uh, you know, thank you, to, thank you to everyone who's still working, still keeping busy uh, and plodding on and keeping everything going. Uh, to everyone else, if you've been affected by this, do you know what? Just use this as a good opportunity to think for the future think okay if this happens again what will we do next time so not hoard things but think like you know i i'm i'm a bit of a skin flint like uh i don't really spend a lot of money so i hoard money away so even though i've got no income it's fine it's not really a problem i've i kind of i got i got savings i'll just eat into my savings so uh i i always have money aside just in case i always have things hidden away because you never know you never know when things are going to go a bit weird and a bit bit dodgy so there we go that's out that's that done right tea is stewing let's see how it's doing because you can't have uh, just waving to boaters as they go past what was that boat that boat was is a, a large black wide beam i can't see the name of it they don't have a name on it but i just waved him he was he he was wearing a uh, rainbow colored hat I've probably met them before, but I can't remember faces. Uh, I've got my tea. I've got uh, some Sainsbury's Taste the Difference Belgian white chocolate and raspberry cookies to eat. <sighs> As we know, I'm not really meant to be eating wheat, but uh, bollocks to it. Oh, yeah, I took into them later on. Yummy, yummy, yummy. Um, 
I've, I'll be doing some exercise tomorrow. Oh, because obviously there's no murder mile, which is uh, no murder mile walks, which is great. So I kind of gain a, a, a day each week, which is good in a way. So it's given me more time to catch up with the podcasts. Because uh, Sundays are kind of, a, I can't, unless I'm in town early editing, I can't do anything. But this is good. So it'll give me time to, I'm going to go back down to Richmond and refilm the video that I was going to do uh, for this episode. And I've just, I just checked online. I was like, oh shit, where I am is like eight miles away from where, where the body was dumped. So if I can, I'm going to try and go up there and film a video there as well. So you'd be lucky. There'll be three videos for this one, which is great. Um, everything's all good here. Filled up with water the other day. Oh, I'd run out of water. It's a miracle. Ran out of water, just filled up with coal, gas, logs, the full works. Everything's good. Everything's going great. Um, oh, oh, let's do the questions now. And then we'll we'll do some other bits. Right. Are you ready for your questions? Right, ready. Everyone seems to be enjoying this, so it's very good. Um, um, right. As always, these questions start easy, they get hard. I should really point this out. If sometimes we go through these and there's not 10 questions, or I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 8, 9, 10, that's because it probably relates to a scene that I've edited out of the episode. So... Um, just ignore it it's just you know i can't go back in and re-record stuff and this is the only time i'll edit extra mile is when i have to come back in and take something out which won't make sense to you Whew, that's why i kind of didn't never did questions before but i'm kind of working with it at the moment so question number one what company did kate work for question number two what was the name of the nightclub kate and carl met in Question number three. I sound like a pub quiz guy. What was the name of the pub that they had to drink in? Ooh, all pubs are closed now. Oh, horrible story. Do you hear that? All pubs in the United Kingdom are shut. All pubs are shut. All, pub, all pubs are shut. All pubs. All pubs are shut. All pubs. All pubs. Oh, my God. What a thought. It's really annoying because I've just found a pub around the corner where on Mondays all the pints are two quid. Ah, oh, damn it. Uh, question number four. What road, I- what road is the terrace on? That was question number four. Question number five. What was the name of the self-help book that Kate, that Kate was reading? Question number six. Whilst on remand, what prison was Carl held at? We've mentioned this pub many times before. Question number seven. What degree did Kate do? Question number eight. What three jobs, whether paid or unpaid, did Carl do? Question number nine. Carl lived on the same street as which killer, as previously as previously mentioned in Murder Mile? Mm, that bit would have been edited because I made a bit of a fumble, but not in Extra Mile. Mm. Um, question number 10. Which street and which part of northwest London did Carl leave the car after the murder? Let's hope I don't edit those bits out. Right, OK. Um, I'm going to catch up with films while I'm away. I was, uh, well, while I'm away, but, you know, while we're not doing Murder Mile and stuff like that. So I'm going to, I'm going to do uh, uh, catch up with films that I haven't seen for ages. Uh, I, I've posted on, I'll, I might post a link online. There's a, if you like really obscure kind of uh, films that are out of copyright, I found a website where you can download them. There's some great stuff. What Some of my favourites, 12 Angry Men is on there, the original version, that's on there. The Day the Earth Stood Still, the original version. Uh, M, the Fritz Lang film is on there. Um, uh, what else is there's loads of really great obscure films on there. Some there's really early, uh, some Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes is on there as well. Uh, Day of the Triffids is on there. Do you know, there's some great stuff on there. So uh, I'll post a link to that. But if you're looking for things for, to watch, as you know, I'm a big fan of kind of uh, biographies and things like that. So these are my top re- recommendations. Give them a go. Uh, one of my favourite ones, uh, The Founder, starring Michael Keaton. He, he plays the guy who, who basically uh, uh, didn't create but uh, developed McDonald's. Even if you don't like McDonald's, you're not interested. It's a fantastic story. Check out The Founder. It's really good fun, and Michael Keaton is fantastic. And actually, the guys who play the McDonald's brothers are brilliant. 
uh, first man, obviously the the story about Neil Armstrong, but not it's not about really about his ascent to the moon. It's more about him dealing with the death of his daughter. It's fantastic, really good. The music is fantastic. It's Justin Horowitz does a great score for it. It's a mixture of theremin and harp. Oh God, it's heartbreaking. Uh, King's Speech, bit of a bit of an old one. What ten years ago about about uh, our king. Um, who had the stutter fantastic film really really good i, I highly recommend that um uh if you want to go back a bit uh a film called chaplin starring robert downey jr before he was all famous and got into marvel movies and all, all stuff like that he played charlie chaplin fantastic really good film gods and monsters uh which is a story about uh james whale who directed the uh frankenstein and bride of frankenstein really good it stars brendan fraser and Sir ian mckellen really good film really dark really weird another one obviously i'm slightly obsessed with old star, star movies hitchcock starring uh, Anthony hopkins and helen mirren that's really good it's not not 100 percent accurate but it's a it's a it's a good story about kind of the relationship between hitchcock and, and his wife alma revel Whew, so that's worth checking out um oh it's not today, but when this episode goes out on April 2nd, uh, it will be my sister's birthday. So happy birthday, Stinky. Happy birthday, Stinky, uh, from uh, Fatty and Tubbs. Uh, right, OK. Extra mile bits. Right, let's learn a little bit more about Carl Taylor. Uh, Carl, Ch- T- Carl Joseph Taylor. Ooh, I have a slurp of tea. Watch out. I did a quiet slurp, so not to not to upset anyone. Oh, there's nothing worse than slurpy slurps. Carl Joseph Taylor, born in the nineteen born nineteen eighty, uh, in the borough of Westminster. He kind of grew up around Notting Hill area. Uh, he said he was a martial arts. He had martial arts training, uh, and was a football coach. Um, around the time of the murder, he already had a girlfriend whose name was Laura Chan Lock. Um, she seemed to be. He seemed to be cheating on her, and it seemed we loved being a, uh, you know, a womanizer, things like that. So, ugh. Um, Carl Taylor lived at uh, uh, in Bruce House at thirty five Kemble Street. So Kemble Street. Oh, I can't mention this because this is one of the questions that we just had. But uh, Kemble Street is in the same location as one of the killers in uh, Covent Garden, which is in the questions coming up. I'll mention that shortly. Uh, it's the same building. Basically, it was an uh, old um, uh, series of, of uh, kind of rickety houses and then they were demolished and then the, the Peabody buildings were built and it's in, kind of in that era. Um, uh a couple of queries over, over obviously over Carl's mental health uh, over the last couple of years. Um, it has been been said that he had been talked down from trying to throw himself, himself off of building by police, uh, but he had refused proper psychiatric help. I think we can all understand that there's a lot going on inside his head, more than just arrogance i think there's a, a lot that needs to be discussed there uh 2002 he was given a community order for obtaining property by deception at his workplace uh <coughs> um uh there's no, but but there's no real kind of back history with the police here there's no kind of you know history of violence or, or things going on there, there just seems to be a lot of um issues where he 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 was told that he should go and seek psychiatric help but then he um he just denied it uh what else have we got oh i've got that whole letter to the the parents that he wrote to the parents let's see if i can try and find that um sorry i'm gonna have to open up hang on oh michael where is it um first date kid i'm looking at my files okay here we go um this is a letter this is the this is the full well one page of the full letter uh ah come on. ah ah the sun is shining in my eyes sun bugger off it's nice when you're out but not when you're shining through the curtains into my face this is the letter i won't do the voice so he wrote we live in a world where life is hard for all and those who try and embrace the good nature get rejected exclamation mark without any doubt what i did was wrong three exclamation marks but ask yourself this whose life misspelt uh have i really taken i don't expect by writing you this i will be i don't expect by writing you this i will soften your pain but as birds sing and flowers grow in spring remember katie 
and to let oh his handwriting's terrible it's a mixed mix, he's tried to write in capitals but it's, it's failing massively uh and let the love you have and always had for her and always will be like the drub beats in your heart when she first opened her eyes he's so full of shit whenever you miss her think of uh, think of a star and i promise you just like i saw her for myself she will always be singing misspelled he's written singing uh and that's in your hearts forever remember you have not lost her since you never lo- since she never lost you and then he signs it off what twat uh i'd love to see the full letter i've only got part of the letter i'd love to see the full letter um will we ever get that no i mean this this case uh, the the proper file for this won't be available until probably 2080 or something like that so uh yep uh so he was sent to prison he was jailed for at least 30 years behind bars so he'll that's a, a maximum life sentence uh 30 years before parole so he will be 57 by the time he comes out that will be 2038 before parole is considered so he's halfway through his sentence at the moment uh judge giles foster said to him you are an, you are arrogant you are manipulative you are hi- you are highly dangerous I am satisfied that this was a murder done for gain. You went to meet this girl equipped with a knife. She was doing no more than looking looking to you for friendship. You took advantage of the vulnerability of a girl for your own end. Uh, what else we got? What else we got? Oh, that's, oh, that's all I had. I think I put, I put most of it in the story, to be honest. Oh, right. Right. Okay, let's do the questions. Uh okay. Question number Oh come on mouse, stop shifting around. Right. Uh question number one. What company did Kate work for? The answer was Centrica. Centrica is kind of the uh, a multinational company that contains British gas and Scottish power and all of them combined. Uh question two What was the name of the nightclub that Kate and Carl met in? It was the CC Club. Uh, it's basically it's on Coventry Street. It's uh, it's it's pretty much next to uh, Bubblegum Shrimp, Bubblegum Shrimp, uh, in the Trocadero. Uh, I think it's not there anymore. Uh, question three: What was the name of the pub they had to drink in? It was the Roebuck. Not anymore. Hmm. That will have closed. There you go, Coot. Coot's upset about all the pubs being shut. Question four: What road is the terrace on? That was Richmond Hill. Question five. What was the name of the, of the self-help book Kate was reading? <gasps> I haven't written the answer there, but I believe it was You Can Heal Your Life. I hope it was. Uh, question number six. Whilst on remand, what prison was Carl held at? The answer was Wandsworth Prison. Famous prison. We've mentioned this before. This is where John George Haig was held, the Blackout Ripper and Reg Christie. Wonder if you like an ass cup of tea. Um, question seven: What degree did Kate do? The answer was tourism. I mean, the full title was tourism and leisure, but I just wrote down tourism. Um, question number eight: What three jobs did Carl do? He mentioned that he was a personal trainer, a martial arts instructor, and a football coach. Question number nine: Here we go. Carl lived on the same street as which killer? As mentioned in the previous episode of Murder Mile. Well, he lived at 35 Kemble Street, uh, which is the same street as Marianne Moriarty. If you remember, this was the the, uh, episode back in the 1880s where she had a really abusive drunken husband called Daniel. He would beat her up a lot. Uh, And she kept going to the police and saying he's beating her up and the police couldn't do anything. So one day she got out an axe and she whacked him multiple times over the head with the axe. Good riddance. Um, question 10 which street and which part of northwest london did, did carl leave his car did carl leave kate's car after the murder Whew. the answer was leopold road in halsden 
I used to live in Harlston. Lovely, lovely place. Yeah, very lovely. I used to live in an old care home there, an old OAP care home, which uh, was a cheap place to live because they were shutting it down and they needed kind of care uh, guardians to look after it. So I lived there for a bit. You barely had a roof. It was leaking on the roof. Uh, it, it had rats. I remember uh, a big cockroach roll crawling over my leg as I was watching telly uh, uh, we had mice but the rats ate the mice uh, it was pretty grim uh, but after a year of living there and it hadn't been opened as a care home for about four three or four years we got something from the council in there or whoever and it basically said uh, you've been cert certified four stars out of five for cleanliness hygiene and food preparation do you know those signs you've seen when you go into it's whether it's in britain but i don't know whether it's elsewhere it's uh, before you go into a restaurant there's a little green sign that says this is to certify that this place is 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 fantastic blah 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 and you know if it's one star you know to avoid it if it's four or five star you know it's good and it's been certified this place hadn't been open for three years three or four years and yet we were getting one of these things saying well done you got four stars so it shows that that's a con so be very very careful about that uh, if you can go on to trip that's what I do when I go to the restaurants I go straight on TripAdvisor and have a good old per peruse you can you can work out who are the good people because most people are pretty good some people if they've got a bit of a beef or, or it's like Amazon isn't it when you look on there and it's like 5 star 5 star 5 star 1 star and then you look at the 1 star and it's like some twat, some twat goes uh, I, uh, this doesn't seem to work and it's like yeah you've got it you've got to charge it up mate you've got to plug it in first it's like you know idiots are on there but you can work out most things Whew, right so i think that was enough that was enough wasn't it yeah that was and that extra mile was too long right i'm going to start shutting down uh, i'm going to edit this i'm going to edit the last week's episode that i haven't finished editing yet and then i'm going to start writing next week's episode so that was that stay safe stay chipper keep your chin up Drink lots of tea because apparently that's good for you. Eat lots of biscuits. Look after people. Uh, be nice to people. Don't go into shops and start shouting at people. Uh, be polite. Be more polite than you would normally be because other people are having a hard time as well. This is not about you. It's about everyone else. So be nice to everyone. I'm finding that people are doing... Have you... I'm, I'm about to say goodbye, but it's all gone weird. Right, have you noticed that? I'm noticing this at the moment, that the world is split into two different groups. There's there's the shouty people who go everywhere and like, I want this, I want this, why isn't this here? La, 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 being absolute twats. And then there's the other end of people where everyone is being more polite because they understand that everyone is in a difficult situation. It's not about me, it's about us. And it's interesting, isn't it? It's like, I'm I'm very polite, but I'm more polite than usual i've noticed you get a better reaction from people so be polite treat everyone with respect breathe if you have to don't get all stressy about stuff don't get panicky just chill out and listen to murder Mile. okay that's me done okay uh bye bye speak to you soon bye bye